thanks so much for joining us, man. We just want to ask you first a little background, like where are you from originally, where you grew up, that sort of thing. Uh, I'm from Salem, Oregon. Um, I lived there from 1987 to 1991, and then I lived in Twin Falls, Idaho from 1991 to 2002, and I moved back to Salem, Oregon from 2002 until 2011 when I moved to Colorado, and I've been out here for eight years now. Okay, and we have a lot of questions later on about what's transpired in those last eight years uh, and also about music, but just because of the nature of your music and some of the lyrics, I just wanted to respectfully ask you, was there anything in your childhood or growing up um, that was a kind of of the more uh, esoteric nature, supernatural? Did you witness anything? Are you from a, a spiritual background? A- anything like that that might have influenced the course of your art as you got older? Yeah, I would say so. Um, my, uh, my parents aren't religious. The first book my dad ever gave me was The Demon Haunted World by Carl Sagan, and he gave that to me like right after Green Eggs and Ham when I was like four or six or something. Um, so it's always been a part of my worldview to, you know, approach the cosmos with questioning and, and, and wondering. But also my mom is kind of like, she would she probably say she's like a spiritualist type of person. I did go to Catholic school for three years in Idaho, even though I'm not Catholic and neither my parents, but uh, it's just a small town. But uh, she's never been someone to try to imprint a religious view on me. Like, if you were to ask her, she'd probably say she believes in the Force, you know, like in Star Wars. <laughs> but uh, she would, you know, the study of history and archaeology was like my dad's type of impression on me, and my mom's always been kind of like a more mystical and esoteric philosophy type of person, not like as you and I would refer to esotericism or the occult or whatnot, but for a normal person who works for the government, she's definitely like a little bit more of a freak than her co-workers would have been. And so they were always like, my sister's an artist, she played violin, I played like my whole family played music and appreciated nature and things like that, which, you know, I, I do that stuff every day, so I think I think they did a pretty good job not making me be a complete fucking putz in this world. <laughs> I uh, I would agree, man, as, as somebody who um has spent a little bit of time uh, getting to know you, man. Uh, thanks for sharing that, man. My next line of question was more about music, and you mentioned you obviously come from a musical family. Uh, where does where does guitar come in? Uh, my dad my dad played guitar growing up, so I, I had guitars in the house that I would not be allowed to play. But I like you know he'd go to work and I would go in the in the closet and like pull out his Les Paul. He was like. <laughs> of a 58 uh, Stratocaster, which has a neck stamp from October 1958, mm-hmm. which is like two or three months before they officially introduced it as a production model, so it's very old, very early. And uh, he has like an old 60s Les Paul and a bunch of old like weird Dan Electros. I actually have his little, uh, his, I have a 64 Fender Vibro Tamp amp here in my room that was his little practice amp. And I'm, so all that stuff would just be around the house and I'd like go play with it. Then I have to put it back before he'd come home. But then of course, it's like if you take the car and park it in the same spot, they'll still know you took it. You know? Yeah, <laughs> you can just you can just tell. <laughs> wow. So so uh, what what is the progression towards uh, rock and metal music? Uh, my dad's like a, he's always been a rock rock and blues guitar player. My dad's uh, he's like a Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, Les Paul type of guy. Okay. Um, you know Dave Edmonds, David Lindley. You know guitar stuff. I still actually. People like John Fahey, the acoustic guitar player, and then people like Enya. My dad was all, was always having classical music or Enya playing on the radio for the dogs growing up, and so I would come home and you know most people would turn shit like that off, but I really like it, so I would just just listen to Mozart or Enya or whatever. And also, when I lived in Idaho, it was, we lived in a town of like eighteen or twenty thousand people, and uh, it's a super Mormon town. Not a lot of art or culture or art and culture appreciative types of people. So I would just basically hang out in the desert and uh, kind of similar to your previous question, I would like do those 3D puzzles with uh, like a pharaoh head, you know, or a pyramid, you know, and I would like pretend to be an archaeologist and dig up those little, you could buy like a, a little plate and you dig out a dinosaur bone out of it and you paint it, you know what I mean? I would do stuff like that. But uh, yeah, he was always trying, he didn't really play guitar. He stopped playing guitar probably in the early 80s. But it's all he's always listening to guitar, and the guitars are always around the house. And so I just prefer guitar-oriented music, whether it's acoustic music or you know electric sort of guitar. Yeah, so so I guess it's it's safe to say that the progression into rock-based music and playing guitar was very natural. It was part of your family uh, in a way, then. Yeah, it was just 
it, was, it seemed very normal to me to just try to play the guitar. I didn't actually start playing the guitar until 2002, and uh, actually played bass first just because it seems easier. But um, it was more because the acoustic guitar was the only guitar I could play in the house, and then the bass. I, I still have that bass here. I think actually it's a '60s K bass, like an SG boot. Like it's pretty, it's pretty chill. But I've always just appreciated, you know, the rock and roll type of active guitar playing music. Yeah, yeah. And and you say uh, 2002 was your first band, uh, it, Leech, in 2004. No, that was, that was yeah, that was 2004. Um, I was in a band in 2003 with the bass player Nate from Leech called SARS, like the, the respiratory disease, and okay. uh, that was that was like really snotty, bad punk, and uh, we did that from actually I think that might have been 2002, so maybe I started playing guitar in 2001, maybe I'm not sure. It was right when I right when I moved back to Oregon, which was in May 2002. I had just started playing, so maybe early 2002, um, I started playing the bass. And when I moved back to Oregon in that summer, I uh, I met those guys and we started playing punk music. Were you also part of a band? Uh, from if I'm pronouncing it right, Moon, but it's it's spelled M U N N. Yeah, yeah, that was supposed to be the complete opposite of Sun. And uh, it was supposed to be very, very evil and aggressive, antagonistic, drone, just like hate music, just noise drone, very extreme. But, you know, we were like 17 or 19 or something like that. So I guess actually by the time we got to Moon, I, I would have been 18, I think. Okay. In your late teens, you're already involved in a, a few different projects. Um, and did you do any touring with either of those bands? Did you get out and see the world a little with them or...? No, I didn't go on tour until I was 20 um, in 2007. And uh, we had two bands comprised of various Leech and Moon members. One was like a stoner metal band called, uh, well, not even stoner metal, kind of like Krusty Sludge Party Stoner Metal called Vault Dweller. It kind of sounds like Dystopia and Black Sabbath, um, but it's all like Mad Max and Waterworld themed. <laughs> and then uh, awesome. uh, me and the Leech drummer, Moon drummer, Kyle, had a band called Ancestor Tooth that was just like, you know, burning with corrupted stum style, like really just simple sludge doom. And we did a tour in December 2007, and that was the first time that uh, I got to go see that. Our van actually broke the day we left for the tour, so then the five of us had to pull all the money we had saved up to go on tour with to just buy the only other van on Salem Morgan yeah. Craigslist that day. And so we left our veggie oil bread truck in an Ace Hardware parking lot and then went on tour in this tiny van. We actually had, we had a bass player for Ancestor Tooth up until that tour, and then we didn't want to go with him because we didn't really get along. And so it turned out that they only, only could fit five people in the van, so we're like, sorry, dude, got to go. That's a nice but, way to kick someone out. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's hard being 20, man. People yeah. don't know. And you said you had a van that had been converted to run on vegetable oil? Yeah, Nate from from Leech and Stars, who's now in hell and Predatory Light and does Eternal Warfare and all that stuff. He he was a super environmentalist type of experimenter guy. He's still pretty handy, and uh, he we had a giant Wonder Bread truck with a uh, it was all painted brown, and we actually had people living in it at, at our old house in Salem, and uh, we were, we had all of our bikes and skateboards in it. And we drove, and it just died on the way out of town, and so we had to go buy a new van and then show up to the first show really late. And then I don't think it ever drove again, but we had people live in it as like an outside room. We had it all insulated with like a PlayStation in there. It was pretty cool. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Wow. Unfortunately, it died. And that was, uh, 2007 was also, if I'm not mistaken, the year you started Wood Smoke Records? Uh, that was the first time we got something released. Yeah, it was for that tour. We did a, a Leech Against Leviathan demo CDR reissue of our regular demo that had come out in August of 2007. And then we did an Answer to Truth Vault Dweller split CD. And uh, we'd actually started the label in 2006, but we didn't have anything to release at that time. So, And we started with CDRs and then gradually went to tapes. Was it just for um, your projects and projects of uh, members of your bands, or have you released other um, other people that aren't involved in your circle? Um, when Kyle and I started it, it was exclusively to be uh, our vanity label for Leech and affiliated solo projects. But in 2008, eight or nine, um, Nate was also involved, and so he started, he released some outsider bands. He released a split between the Canadian band Skagos and uh, a band called Tom Hat. They're both the kind of black metal Indian bands, and that was the first time that people who were not like 
living in our house were on the label, which was fine because Ray, Ray was our friend. But it did kind of, at the time, you know, rub us the wrong way. So then they consequently started uh, Eternal Warfare Records kind of as a response to Kyle and I's immature reaction to him doing that. And so now Nate runs a festival and Wood Smoke is obscure as fuck. So I think it all worked out. <laughs> is is Wood Smoke still uh, a, an active label? I know you're busy with a lot of other stuff. Um, I'm trying to get the Spectre Voice Blood Incantation Split 7-inch repressed because people have been selling that for like $50 since the month it sold out and we didn't uh, have any on tour. Um, so we're trying, me and the Bleak Environment guy are trying to get that taken care of. But I'm um, actually, I'm personally banking on this next tour. Um, so I can hopefully, like, you know, we make some money on tour, not too much. And so if I could come back with, uh, you know, a couple, five or $800 to spare after bills and shit, then I would just put out that seven inch again and, we can get that going, and then I want to do another seven inch for me and my girlfriend's band, Catonic Beauty. Um, that we might do a seven inch with either Carbonized, which is Chaps and Necrot's label, or maybe Carbonized and Wood Smoke or whatever. But just you know, I do, I do want to make it more legit. The whole, the whole time, why it takes so long is that I just want to try to make it good and like a cool thing. But I'm poor and I'm kind of lazy and I'm like always working or going on tour, so it's hard to just dedicate time to a label specifically so I only really have it as an afterthought although we do have a new release um, coming out this year uh, for a funeral doom band that also started in 2007 called the Dismal Dimensions that is only now finally having a full lineup so we're going to do a pro demo for that and uh, should be out by the end of the year all right cool man I just wanted to ask some questions about that sort of thing because once people um, who might casually get into blood incantation uh, start peeling back the layers, there's a lot to you and your guys uh, scene and your your circle of projects and uh, different entities. Um, but you mentioned blood incantation and spectral voice. So moving at, moving forward, um, you eventually end up in Colorado, and I assume that's where you meet Isaac and Morris. Uh, yeah, I, I moved to Colorado to join a band called Velnius, which is kind of like a, a folky Black Dune style band. And uh, I had been a live member going on tour with them for about a year and a half, starting in the summer of 2010, and uh, actually, I guess the spring of 2010. And I flew out from Oregon in the spring of 2010, the summer of 2010, the spring of 2011 to go on tours with them and then moved there in August 2011 and then I met Jeff who incidentally when I had the last three tours they had a different bass player and when I moved there I was under the impression I was going to be living with this dude and these guys in this band but then he had like flaked off with the drummer's girlfriend and like all these things <laughs> were all dramatic and lame so then Jeff came out from Chicago because he knew the Velvet's the, the band was from Chicago, but had moved to Boulder. And so then the, Jeff knew them from back then. And then I met Jeff maybe like four or five days before we went on uh, 2011 West Coast Valiant's tour when we recorded uh, their second record, Brew Eater. And I met Jeff like the week before we left. And we've literally been jamming since the day we met. And so I've known Jeff now since the day I got to Colorado. And uh, we were in that band. I think I was in the band from 2011 to or 2010 to 2014, and Jeff was in from 2011 to maybe 15. But then when I quit, it was to focus primarily on Spectre Voice and Blood Incantation, which at the time had just been, you know, wood smoke tapes and side projects and rehearsal demos and stuff like that. And then but when I decided I needed to really commit and try to focus on, on manifesting those specific projects, um, it, just, it was the time time was right for, for me to leave Vilnius and then uh, Jeff also left for more or mostly the same types of reasons and uh he first came over to spectra voice and then he came from spectra voice into uh blood incantation right before we went on our first tour but to sorry to get distracted i actually met isaac before i had moved here um when i was just doing a session tour with those guys and then both of our bands played together here in denver and uh I really liked the way he played guitar, which was he was in like a Death Doom, Black Doom type of band with some Funeral Doom guitar harmonies. And so then I actually uh, approached him about joining Abysmal Dimensions. And then I didn't know he played drums until we had been jamming Funeral Doom for a few months. And then when I heard him playing on his old band CD, Sentimani, it's like it's like Emperor, um, kind of like being, it's like more like mainstream style extreme metal, you know, 
but he's a great fucking drummer. And I was like, well, dude, this is your high school band. You play drums like this? And then, then we started, then I was like, I also have these other songs. So then we started Blood Incantation. And now it's 2011. Yeah, and then Spectral Voices uh, shortly after that, right? Yeah, uh, Isaac and I have been trying to find another guitar player for like a year. And then we met Morris uh, at a party in, in Boulder. And he was like, I think he was just the other dude with a leather jacket at this party, honestly. And so like the three or four of us just like stayed in the corner and um, started chatting or whatever. But then we played as a three piece when we recorded our first EP in 2013, which did not come out until 2015. But um, Interdimensional Extinction was recorded in July 2013. And uh, we had a Damon from Morphal Congregation and Stargazer play Fretless Bass because we just couldn't find anybody to play Fretless here. And uh, then... Jeff plays fretless. He didn't. I, I, you know what? I don't think he played fretless in Vilnius. I think he played fretless first in Spectral Voice, and that's why we just kept bothering him. Like, yo, dude, come on, come on over to Spectral Voice. Because at that time, Spectral Voice was just me and Eli originally in 2012. And when we were writing the first couple of songs, we both played guitar, and he played guitar and drums. And then on the Necrotic Doom demo we recorded in 2014, it was uh, just the two of us. But Morris was the live guitar player for Spectral Voice and then the actual guitar player for Blood Incantation, and then Jeff was the actual bass player for the Spectral Voice, um, technically before Morris joined, and then like they both switched into the other band, if that makes sense. So it wasn't. we didn't intentionally just be like, let's just start the same band with the same five people. <laughs> yeah, it might have ended up being a good strategy sometimes, right? Yeah, I think I think it works just fine. Uh, those, you, those guys are my best friends, and we're, you know, we just hang out basically with each other not in like a weird way we just like all have jobs and then we're all in like three or four bands with each other so it's like it's natural that we just keep starting more bands with each other yeah i mean it's probably a lot easier than starting bands with totally different people and totally different schedules uh you know like it i do it, it could be a headache sometime man i uh i had a few questions actually that you just answered i was going to ask you about damon from stargazer playing on that record and uh, you know you explained that and and where jeff fits in man so i'm just going to skip ahead um and ask you you mentioned your interdimensional extinction uh, EP that was on Dark Descent Records. Do you have a relationship with Dark Descent Records since uh, you're you're from a, a similar part of the country, or or was there an existing relationship before? Well, that? no. Well, originally I I just was like a customer. Eli had known him and would like do some work with him at various festivals and stuff like that. From because Eli's lived in Denver since I want to say 2007, and uh, so he's known Matt the whole time. But I only met him. Actually, with that band Velnius, when we played a show in uh, Colorado Springs in 2000, I want to say 11, not positive, but uh, yeah, I think it was 2011. And uh, I actually had bought a record from him, or I, rather, I was trying to buy a record from him. It was the uh, that band and Hedonist that we really like from Seattle that our friends are in. Their record had just come out, and I was trying to buy this record from him, but he didn't. He didn't take a card at the time, so then I had to go find an ATM at the bar. And then when I came back to the show, man, I was gone. And I emailed him, and I was like, yo, dude, where the fuck did you go? I was trying. I just went to the ATM to get this record. And he had, like, a panic attack or something, so then he had to leave. But then since then, every time I messaged him, he kind of, like, would remember me, you know? But then we would be sending him rehearsal demos and, like, a YouTube link to watch us play a show or whatever. And he never really hit us up until when we were on the... The YouTube, basically, like when we had uh, the 2014 Blood and Condition promo tape, Astral Spells, put on YouTube, and people started chatting about that. Then he reached out to Eli, even though he knew we were Eli and I were both Inspector Voice too. He reached out to Eli, Inspector Voice practice for my number, and then after he got Blood and Condition, then he was like, "What about what Inspector Voice too?" So, and we do know each other physically. Like I used to go down there. For a couple of years, I would go down there and work pretty regularly, but anymore, I'm just a little too busy up here to make it down. But I'm going to go down there next week, I think, so. We've we've been friends for seven years or something, six, seven years. Yeah, great label. Uh, you know, real, real strong roster. You know, uh, for anyone who's listening who may not be familiar with Dark Descent Records, uh, if you're familiar with Blood Incantation, you might want to check out the rest of that label and the other yeah, bands they've dealt bands. with over the years. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I know you guys in Spectra Voices... Uh, I mean, Spectral Voice, uh, pardon me, man. I'm, I didn't get much sleep either. Um, <laughs> you guys did splits with, um, uh, you did the split with Blood Incantation that you mentioned before, but also with Vastum and Frenolith, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, we're about to do another one with uh, Anhedonist, and then we're going to do 
I think one more actually. I'm not sure. I'm trying. I'm trying to do a shit ton of splits so that we can get a compilation CD. I'm real, I think that'd be really cool. Like a like a discography type of thing, like a collection. Nah, nah, just like all the non-album stuff. Like so, you get because like, all the seven inches and things like that. You know, just get them all on a CD. Because if you have most of the Spectre Voice songs are like seven minutes long anyway. Yeah. So yeah. if you get five or six split seven inch songs, you think that's forty minutes? I think it's fair. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a great it's a great counterpoint. You know, as as a as a listener, as a fan, it's a great counterpoint to Blood Incantation because it has more of a, a slow, like atmospheric. Uh, you know, not not to compare, but like maybe uh, bands like Winter or Disembowelment or something like that. Um, yeah, definitely. It, it, much different uh, energy and atmosphere to Blood Incantation, but you could still tell that it's uh, uh, you know, similar artists and uh, you know, similar mindset setting out in terms of the production and the philosophy behind it. Yeah, it's good for us to be able to do, like, each one is a started out very specific and kind of grown into its own thing, which are both proportionate to each other. And, you know, people people sometimes already complain that, you know, Blood Incantation has too many funeral doom parts or Spectre Voice has too many death metal parts, but it's like, it allows each of us to do more in that respective kind of weird niche growth where, like, you know, the difference between the Spectre Voice demo, even the seven inches in the demo, and then the, the album, I think is, is pretty substantial. And then the Blood Incantation EP is pretty straightforward. Um, and then the album, I thought, was a pretty big growth from that. And then the next the next one we're doing for both, like, the next track, Spectral, the next two tracks Spectral are going to record are both, like, they go even further into the abstract style of Doom, like uh, the finish Unholy or warm phlegm and uh, like just eccentric fucking funeral dismal dismal music you know it's, it's like it gets into kind of some I don't know, I don't know. I'm, I'm fucking really excited I think the, the, <laughs> the next two special voice songs are the heaviest songs we have and uh, they're not recorded yet and then the next Blood of Contagion album is fucking bonkers man people are gonna really be upset I can't wait that that's great. To, I'm excited to hear that. And before we ask you about um the new Star Spawn, I mean the new album, <laughs> you see where I'm going already. I'm tripping over myself. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about 2016, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Star Spawn album, also on Dark Descent Records. Um, yeah. That's the first release where Jeff performed on it, right? Um. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and just kind of yeah. speaking from what from you you explained how you guys all kind of met in Colorado in the early stages of the band. Do you feel like with Star Spawn? It was maybe like um, I don't I don't know like the the end of a, of a of a season or you guys had had a, a level of completion to the band or, or anything of that nature. I, I, I would agree. I mean, we played shows as a three piece for Blood Incantation without a bass in 2013 and 14, and there's some real cringy videos on YouTube. But <laughs> uh, it's really I think very important to our sound. Not I mean any band I think that plays intricate and layered music I think really needs a a good bass player and I think Jeff's a great bass player and especially on a fretless bass and maybe, maybe people, don't, people don't know but he only plays a four string fretless in Blood Incantation and uh, he plays a five string in Spectral which people would probably think would be switched but uh, the, uh, the when Star Spawn was recorded in January 2016 we were completely confident in the fact that this was going to be the end of one type of our life and the beginning of a new type of thing and uh you know, Jeff and I had been a band together for five or six years at that time, and uh, Isaac and I had been playing music for the same amount of time, and that was, I want to say, I think Interdimensional was Morris's first record, but it, I think Star Spawn was his first full-length album, and uh, maybe Isaac too, actually, but um, it really, we went into the studio completely prepared you know, which is a luxury that I don't usually get and most bands don't usually get. We were so focused on exactly what we were trying to do that it just whizzed by. And, like, we had all the art done by the time we entered the studio. We had, like, posters everywhere and, like, movies and conspiracy shit everywhere. And, like, it was just a, it was like a totally immersive environment. And we did all the songs in, like, one or two takes. I think... Uh, Hidden Species it was the only song that, that took three takes, but all the rest is either one or two, just because we were really feeling it. And uh, since then, man, it's been a very crazy last couple of years. We just basically, this, this now, right now, um, since we got back from the last Factor Voice European tour with Demolich in 2018, 
we have been home from October until February, which is the longest I've been home since we started going on tour in 2015 with these bands. Wow. So, yeah, we yeah. like I think the longest I was home was five weeks in the last three years. And um and uh, just you know I I wanted to ask you about some of these uh, performances and tours that you've had um especially since uh, Starsborn came out and then the following year in 2017 Dark Descent released Spectral Voices album Eroded Quarters of Unbeing if I got that right um yeah and uh, and so 2017 seems like was a big year historically for you guys uh, you did a roughly two week European tour with Crucimentum yeah the the first Blood Invitation European tour was in March with uh, Crucimentum. I actually got, I thought my 30th birthday was in Berlin where my dad was born, which is pretty crazy. Wow. And uh, we, uh, that was an awesome tour. So we first met Daniel from Killtown Bookings and um, then we came back and we did, and we recorded the Spectre Voice album in February, if I remember. So we did a festival with both bands in January or maybe February, actually. I think we recorded a, a week after this festival and then we basically we played this fest called Stardust Fest in New York and, uh, and then we recorded the album and we were actually, we were in the same studio that we recorded Star Spawn in but it was the new location. Um, we recorded Star Spawn and then the Frenolith and Vastum split songs in his old location and then we moved and we were the first band to record in the new location and we were actually in the studio for two or three days longer. We were there for at least a week and uh, I think that the just as far as like you know, on the art side of things, I think the Spectral album is more concise and more immersive because we had more time to really just hammer it in and be like, let's make it fucking weird, you know. Whereas the Bloody Condition album, I think we did all the tracking in three days and then we mixed for a day or whatever. And uh, so it's a lot more fresh and kind of upbeat sounding, a lot more vivid and urgent, but... And speaking of recording Blood Incantation, you guys record live and you recorded on analog for that, or maybe I'm wrong? Yeah, yeah, both bands um, <clears throat> for both albums were recorded live, and then we just did vocals and synths and some guitar lead overdubs. But all the, the four instrument tracks are recorded in sync at the same time uh, on two-inch tape. That's uh, pretty rad. You don't get that too much today in metal. Yeah, I personally think that that's, that's just the way I like to play. You know, I think that you get a better response because even though people don't want to believe that something you can't see has any effect on something you can see, energy exists everywhere, everything's all these frequencies oscillating and emanating, and so there is an intangible quality which is literally magnetized to magnetic tape, and uh, you, can, you can feel the impression in a distinct intangible nuance that uh, cannot be replicated digitally and you can still play great digitally and you can make an album that sounds really fucking heavy but i do think that there's more to music in general than just the heaviness of it there's, there's something inside that you can you can connect to even if you don't intellectualize it you know you can just feel the vibe or whatever and i think that that's a lot harder to do individually tracking Wow, I I agree with everything you said, and I don't think I could have intellectualized it as well myself. But I I, <laughs> I agree with you strongly, man. I feel that um, some something that uh, you know is uh, is maybe lacking a little bit in today's scene. But there are a lot of younger bands um, and and older bands uh, ta you know taking that 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 same mindset. Uh, you know, maybe a more organic recording approach, organic production. I think it's I think it's useful. Back in the day, man, there was only one way. Mm -hmm. You had to play it right the first time or the first, third time, but you had to play it right, and uh, you could you could you could punch in an instrument like an isolated track, no problem. But uh, you couldn't construct it piece by piece until the '70s. You know what I mean? And then yeah. you started doing multi-tracking for like a little home studios and stuff like that, little home reel to reels. And I think a lot of great fucking records are made by one person multi-tracking everything. Like Brian Eno does that, and it does that. A lot of metal bands do that, and I think it's fucking great. And a lot of times, you know, you can you can get a different type of energy out of the music if it's just one person doing everything because, like I said, when there's four people jamming at the same time, the vibe is going to be different than one guy methodically being like, this is what I'm trying to do right now. Right. Sometimes it can be too many chefs. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, yeah. it, you know, it's there's all different fruit in life, you know, it's a, you know, it's all different stuff that can happen that is each going to have a different effect and there's no necessarily good or bad about recording, you know, but there's just different effects on the listener, different effects on just the whole thing, you know. For some, like, I would like to do a, single, a solo album where I just multi-track a bunch of synths and acoustic guitars and 
make some experimental thing, but that wouldn't sound good all jamming together. It'd sound like a fucking jam band. That would suck. <laughs> but like, you know. Well, uh, speaking of older bands, in 2017, you guys also got to open up the Colorado date of the Decibel Tour, right? And that was uh, Creator, Obituary, Midnight, and Horrendous, if I got that right? Uh, yeah, that's right. Was that your first support show for bigger acts like that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that's still the biggest show we played in Denver, for sure. And uh, I think at the time, that was the biggest show we played in the States until we played... Uh, Actually, no, that was in 2017, yeah. Uh, so we we had played California Death Fest in 2016, and that was a couple thousand people, which is pretty awesome. But even in Denver, we played at like 5 in the afternoon or something, and there was still like maybe 600 people, which is for Denver. That's fucking nuts. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, that's great. Um, we've only ever played big shows with festivals until we did uh, these last couple tours, like that uh, Demolish Artificial Brain Tour, like when we played in, at Reggie's and shit like that. You know, I've played at Reggie's to 200 people. It's a big difference from <laughs> when, when our three bands were there and it was a show, you know? Yeah, yeah, that um, was that was a, a wild tour, man. I had a few questions for you uh, about that, but uh, I just wanted to ask you, too, with that uh, that creator, obituary, midnight, horrendous decibel tour, or what did it open you guys up with anything in terms of booking? I mean, I don't know about even in Colorado, but just... Um, nah, with, with booking Col- Colorado agents, booking people, they're all owned by those fucking Alliance AEG people, and uh-huh. like they don't give a fuck about <laughs> any of our bands dude you got you guys aren't trying to sell 40 tickets to, to open up for somebody or yeah like no yeah. way the yeah. dude fucking danny Sachs has the has denver by the balls and it's like allegedly there's yeah <laughs> got throw got throw that in man um yeah allegedly it's ridiculous <laughs> but like when we play in denver man we, we play at a bar called the high dive which is like a 200 200 capacity person or we play at um a warehouse called Rhinoceropolis, or we play at a place called Syntax, which is like, again, two or three hundred people. We can't, we can't play any of the big venues in uh, in Denver. Well, I mean, it sounds like you guys um, kind of found a way around that with uh, all the things you got going on. And um, be- before we get into that, I just want to ask you too. You guys did uh, October, November, two thousand seventeen, Blood Incantation and Spectral Voice European tour, right? Yeah. And was that the time that both bands went on a tour together? Uh, with you know. Yeah, we played back to back for thirty two shows in a row, and the only day off was when we got stuck and denied from the Ukrainian Russian border, and then had to drive through Ukraine and Poland into Latvia, Lithuania, or Estonia and Lithuania to drive up to Finland because we were supposed to drive through Russia to Finland and come down the peninsula, but we had to go around oh and God. get some shows on like a day's notice. Yikes. So it wasn't really a day off at that time. So it was, uh, that was fucking hellish, dude. And since a lot of those two, a lot of those shows, it was just the two bands. Um, you know, we we like we like to play like thirty five, thirty eight minutes maybe yeah. for both bands. But both of those bands were playing for like fifty minutes to an hour every night, and it was wow, it was hellish, dude. It was fucking so dumb. Don't ever go on tour <laughs> with two of your own bands playing back to back. Oh, it sounds like boot camp or something, man, for touring. Yeah, it really was, dude. It was wow. it was awesome, totally sick, but fucking extreme and very brutal thing. Gee, was that the last thing you guys did before the 2018 uh, tour with um some some dudes' artificial brain and, and uh, Demolish? Uh, yeah. Um, before that, I did a tour with my girlfriend's band Skolex in January on the West Coast, and then uh, Spectre Voice did an East Coast tour with Primitive Man, and then Blood and Condition did came out and did the Artie Brain and Demolich tour, and then we came back and did Maryland Death Fest, and then Search of Voice did a West Coast tour with Mortiferum and Superstition, and then uh, Blood and Condition did a festival tour in Europe, and then Search of Voice did a tour with Demolich after it on Death Fest in Europe, and then we came back. So I think I did six or seven tours last year, actually. Jesus, this guy, man. One of the hardest working people in underground death metal, honestly, man. All, all, the, guy, all the guys in my, in my sweats. Yeah, yeah. No, hey, it's, it's, now you're just flexing on us, man. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> chill out, man. So, so I mean, speaking of, of Demolich, though, um, I mean, I, you know, everybody know I could talk about Demolich for days, blah blah blah. But it's not about me. What was uh, your relationship to their music and your history with their music? I, I know actually your your Astral Spell Blood Incantations Astral Spells tape in 2014. You guys kind of did like a, a tribute with the design to uh, one of Demolich's yeah, old we, demos. Yeah, for their regurgitated. Uh, regurgitation of blood demo um at that time you know demolish was not an active band that was before they did their their uh, 
compilation album on Fart Records that was before they started doing all these touring festival things. Like, And, you know, when I first heard them, it was actually only 2012. We had actually um, already started and, and written some Blood Incantation songs before hearing them. And uh, I heard them from my, my co-worker, Mikey, at uh, this record store, me and Eli, Perspective Boys, used to work at. And he taped, he taped it for me, along with some other Colorado bands like Skeleton of God and Hideous Corpse. And uh, it was in my old car. I had a tape deck, and so you couldn't skip between tracks. And so they have so many start, stops, and catches that I was just like, what is this? Where does this song start and end? Like, what kind of fucking band is this crazy music? You know? And it's still, to this day, after watching them night after night for more than one band's tour, I, they are still mind-blowingly sick. It is, yeah. I don't understand how they can just do that. It's fucking bizarre. Highly recommended like, to... Uh, if anyone is somehow listening to this podcast but doesn't know about Demolich, which I couldn't figure out how that works, but you got to check out Demolich, especially if you, you have the opportunity to see them live. Um, such a classic, obscure weird death metal band and at, at this point Truly. a very influential one there's a lot of bands i'm not gonna i'm not gonna uh clown myself and try to pronounce it right but what's the band Ch- chethelist from canada chethelist. Chethelist. Yeah, yeah i think it's i think it's Chethelist. i'm not i'm not sure I, yeah I, I, blame it on my my long island accent but yeah they're they're uh, anything that guy phil to um I'm, I'm, i'll pronounce his name wrong too phil tugas or phil Tuga. Have you said the, the guitarist? Yeah, the guitarist. Uh, anything that guy touches is gold. But there's so many um, acts. There's also been Replicant from New Jersey that's doing a lot of weird gore guts and demolish inspired music now. So it's it's great to see them kind of getting their day and um, getting a little more recognition in this era. Yeah, plus they're they're more active now than they ever were in the '90s. Like they did they did two tours last year, you yeah, know, and yeah. like the one we did with Spectral was their first European tour ever that wasn't just for festivals. Like that was like. <laughs> You know, play, we played in some squats, and we played, like, they really got to experience what all of us down here on the bottom of the pyramid get to experience on tour. It was pretty great. I'm sure they enjoyed and it, And honestly, too. Auntie, yeah, he loved it. Like, that's the thing. Yeah. Like, a lot of old dudes from classic bands, like, they don't want to fucking sleep in a shitty van that's leaking water. You know, they don't want to fucking play in a squat or some place like in Chattanooga, Tennessee, behind a karaoke bar to hang out by a dumpster but those dudes love it they, just, they <laughs> want to do it hanging your t-shirts on the dumpster to st- as the merch area yeah 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 that was they great. love it yeah, man, uh, great, great memories, man. Um, that Demolich tour, man. It was really great meeting all you guys, and and uh, you know one of the one of the times yeah, in my really- life certainly. Um, what what did what have you taken away from from Demol or you just you know from from Auntie or any of those guys uh, from that experience um, or like what are, what are some if you want to even expand on it what are what's some things you've learned from some of these OGs in the scene that that you've been around and that you've worked with you had Damon from Stargazer you've you've worked around around a lot of very credible people ah uh, well for Demolish I think my one of my favorite things that they do is they they cut to a single guitar riff and instead of letting the guitar finish the measure and then coming in with the drum beat it just comes in halfway through the riff and then is blasting so it comes it just cuts the more guitar and then blasts halfway through the final part of the measure and then starts over and then that's like oh man i love it when they do that <laughs> but uh so we, we try to do that too but it's very fucking hard like those both the both the demo drummers are fucking crazy sick and uh it, when damon uh <clears throat> from Stargazer when he did those tracks we'd actually already toured together because uh, Morphal did a, uh, a tour with Velnius and Morphal Congregation in 2012 in the US and so Jeff and I got to hang out with Damon uh, for like two or three weeks but then even before that actually my, one of my old bands in Oregon Merkstov was a funeral doom band we opened for them on their first year or first US tour ever um, in Portland and I met him then, and I was like, yo, dude, I'm in these bands. Like, we don't have any records out, but, like, we, you know, we recorded it, but it's not out yet. Actually, the Merkstar record came out, like, two or three years after we recorded it and broke up already. But um, it's it's better that way because it's funeral them, so it's more cold, you know? <laughs> yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but, uh, you know, Damon is just a chill motherfucking guy. Like, he just wants to play guitar because he just likes heavy music, man. And, like, he plays... <laughs> all types of music he's in this amazing solo project called the esoteric connection with an x like connection and uh if you guys have not heard it it's fucking sick just like instrumental 70s prog but played like damon style so it's like if stargazer was just prog it's amazing it's it's so good and he plays in fucking martyr and cauldron black ram and plays more like you know a typical kind of numbskull death metal just because it's fun to play 
Then he's got Morpho Congo. He's got fucking Stargazer. He's got all of his kind of art stuff. He's really a multifaceted guy, which is also why um, on that Velnius tour in 2012, I had re- I had rehearsal um, re- like guitar jam tapes that I'd be listening to on the on the Walkman, and I'd be like punishing him at the shows, be like, "Dude, listen to this. This is cool. Check out this riff, man." <laughs> and so then he was like. I might, if you ever need a fucking bass play, I can do it for you, you know, or like, oh, cool, man. And so then when it came time to it, it was just like amazing. And the first, uh, <clears throat> so the Damon played on five songs and four of them are on interdimensional extinction. And the other one is on the split with uh, spectral voice and bloody condition. And he only had tabs for two of the songs, I think. Mm-hmm. Wow. The first two songs are interdimensional. And then, the second two songs and the split seven inch track, he just played by ear. It's not slouch we like material. It's in, we were yeah. like, it's in, it's in drop C, and he's just, he just like, he just <laughs> nailed it, dude. Yeah, that's great. Like, that's he great can, to know. He can, he can handle it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that makes it interesting to listen back to that with that in mind. Um, yeah, he was, he just figured that shit out. And then, then after that, Jeff had to go try to learn that out. So it was like, <laughs> oh, man. Poor Jeff, man. But Jeff's, Jeff's a very capable um, bass player, man. He pulls it off. He is. Another great thing is watching Jeff. Uh, as a blades player grow because both of us when we were in Vilnius were a lot more uh, like I wouldn't even say I'm a very good player because I can only really play as good as Blood Incantation that's like the extent of my playing ability and each new song is like I get a little bit better but like if you compare you know especially like this next Blood Incantation record um, to what Jeff and I were doing in Vilnius it's just fucking sick to see it like you. I like I like when you can just grow you know and you can just get better and not be like I'm not talking like more sweeps and more technical, but just like you're a, a more competent and adept player. You can get your way around the riff more efficiently and, and like more fluid. And, you know, I, that, I love Jeff, man. I've known Jeff for fucking eight years now. And uh, I just feel like we're in two bands together, been in another band. I, like the first time I ever went to Europe, Jeff was there. I've seen more of the world with Jeff by my side than any person on the world. So. Wow, I love that dude. Yeah, I uh, I only met Jeff for the um you know the two weeks that we were on tour together, but I would classify him as a very lovable man, very very po- lovable very, man. very nice positive guy, good guy to hang out with, man, very talented good musician. Guy to hang out with. And some of what you're saying speaks to my next line of questioning. I wanted to ask you uh, on that Demolich tour, you guys recorded at St. Vitus uh, in the New York date the the vitrification of blood. <laughs> Uh, or no live yeah. vitrification uh, cassette, and which where you played vitrification of blood part one, and then the song hidden species vitrification of blood part two as one whole um, piece together, and then side B was a kind of an experimental uh, ambient piece. Yeah, and we also we have the LP right here in the house right now. But we're just we're holding on to it till the decibel tour. But the the LP version is the same A side, and then there's an etching on the B side. <laughs> Okay, so there'll be an LP version of that available when people see you on the Decibel Tour. That's right, if there's any left, hopefully. All right, excellent. Well, I wanted to ask you about that um, that that uh, ambient work and just the nature of you guys doing like um, Im- improvisation, maybe kind of like almost ritualistic jamming uh, and creating that atmosphere. You guys are in two bands together. You've been playing with, with each other a very long time. There's obviously a very strong personal connection between the artists. Um, how how does that play a role in the bands? Uh, just just jamming and being uh, with the same musicians for so long that you guys kind of become bigger than the sum of your parts. I, I agree totally. That's part of the reason why I don't even worry about the lineup stuff because um, it, it, it like you said, man. Once you once you've been playing with people for a long time in a positive relationship, once you've been doing it for a long time, you have like an unspoken but musical language. We all we refer to riffs and sequences in the same type of terminology. Uh, Jeff is actually Jeff and Morris. Actually, I think maybe I'm the only one who is not. But I think everyone in Blood and Condition besides me understands actual music and can like. I know Jeff can read music and like Jeff plays bagpipes. Although, don't tell anybody. He probably doesn't want anybody to know that. <laughs> um, but uh, Isaac was a uh, he like got some drum lessons and understands like theory. Morris Morris has a uh, classical guitar undertones in his playing because he knows how to play you know, Bach and, and you know, uh, classical guitar. Because uh, his dad is actually a, uh, a, like a cult jazz guitar player. His, uh, his dad was, like, asked to play in the Grateful Dead and <laughs> shit. Like, um, but uh, so I actually am the, the weakest of the, some of those parts. But 
because I think I have, because I'll use for for BI, I, I do uh, a lot of the songwriting, and then Isaac does the rest of it for the most part. And, uh, you know, his under background as a drummer and a guitar player, like the way he plays drums is the way he plays guitar. So, like, a lot of drummers are trying to attack a drum, or I'm sorry, a lot of drummers are trying to attack the guitar player with their drum part or trying to, like, do something, whatever, where Isaac, all of his little fills and, like, embellishments seem to enhance the riff itself because he listens to it with the ear of someone who knows how to play the guitar part. And uh, so he arranges songs that way. And the same thing happens for Spectral, actually, where uh, Eli and I do uh, most of the songwriting. And so Eli also plays drums and guitar, so he, he writes at the same time. But as far as improvising together and, and all that stuff, we have, like... You know, we we jam all the time, man. When we practice four or five days a week, and uh, <clears throat> for each band, and we we ship. We some days we do double duty, some days we just do one band for six hours or whichever. But we're always jamming together, and uh, we'll even, you know, I'm not sure if, if there's any police out there, but like we'll jam on mushrooms for hours and write a uh, riff. You allegedly, know I mean? like, yeah, allegedly, allegedly, and <laughs> uh, you know we'll. We, one of the songs, the, the not the next one we're going to record, but the the second of the two newest Spectral Voice songs that sounds super fucked up, like Worm Flam and Unholy. Uh, we, we just we, that's why we started playing in the dark because it was like funny. We would just we play by candles anyway for fun, you know, in the practice space. Yeah, and uh, we would just blow the candles out, tripping, and be like, let's make it as black as we fucking can because you know your eyes get better in the dark or whatever. And so we just we wrote this song in the darkness you know, allegedly tripping on mushrooms and uh we made this it's like eight or nine minutes. It's fucking it's very spooky. And then, you know, BI will do it. But we also you know, we allegedly were on mushrooms for some of those shows with the artificial brain demo which to it. But uh <laughs> you know, we can't we can't party too hard because blood incantation technically is a is a lot harder to play. Um Yeah. So Yeah. But we do jam all the time. Like we have we have on, on the next record coming up we have a uh, a purely instrumental song that is um it's very dreamlike and, and psychedelic ethereal and uh <clears throat> very unusual and it turns into like psychedelic slam at the end um but it's just it's just an instrumental track because it's like we just we improvise a lot together and we come up with like weird guitar effects and and uh weird time signatures and like I don't understand time signatures because I don't think time exists but like you know <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> Isaac can count it out and he's like this one is like 518 and I'm like okay you know whatever yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so we have, we have a full a fully it started out as improvisation uh, into what we've now reined into as like a couple minute experimental death metal track and so we're trying to do more and more of that actually the new album is uh it's very much inspired by the 70s progressive music and uh, stuff like Eloy and Ashraw Temple and uh, like the crowd rock and the fucking dude Bo Hansen. Everyone used to be checking out Bo Hansen records. They're like $3 records, but they're incredible. He's a Norwegian, or he's, I think they're actually Swedish, um, but he's a, he's a jazz guitar player from the 60s who made four solo albums that are all instrumental prog fusion in the 70s and they're based on, one's based on Lord of the Rings, one's based on Watership Down, and then two are just solo albums that just sound like just sick prog. You know, it's it's amazing, dude. And uh, so we, you know, we listen to a lot of Pink Floyd when we're driving around on tour, and like, you know, we like the 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 more abstract style. Like we were watching uh, live in Pompeii at that hotel when we met you guys on that demo tour. Like when we got picked up, that's we were watching that entire thing on YouTube in the hotel. And just you know, we we really like experimental progressive music. You know, Brian Eno is one of my biggest inspirations in life. I really like uh, bands like metal bands, especially that can incorporate non-metal influences but still keep it brutal and and be experimental but not be like annoying. You know, because like, music is just expression, expression and creativity, and you don't need to make it all. Uh, intellectualized like it's more you know it's just, just trying to listen to something you can get a feeling out of or whatever and i think that there's a lot of non-metal <clears throat> music out there that a lot like a lot of metal people just only listen to metal and that's fine but uh i think that you get more out of even just metal bands you could like if you don't listen to only metal and you listen to a band that only listens to metal 
you can get a still deeper understanding out of it, you know, whereas, like, if you listen to, like, the next Blood and Condition record and you don't like experimental music, you're going to fucking hate it, which is sick. Um, <laughs> but... Well, it could also, uh, I mean, it could also perhaps be um, uh, a gateway for some people to get into some of that more expensive, experimental music, uh, you know, and that's, that's what's good about it, man, is it kind of goes both ways. <clears throat> a lot of people might get into, say, a band like Malignancy, um, and not even realize that they enjoy the technicality and maybe like the progressive influence there until they get a little older and they start hearing uh, some yeah, of these exactly. some of these older bands that influence that you know so as as long as people mm-hmm. keep an open mind and they're willing to do their homework uh, you know it could go both ways man but that's um, that's really great to hear and it's going to be interesting to hear your new album man I'm very excited for that um, are you guys recording it before or after this Decibel tour you're doing where you're supporting uh, Morbid Angel and Cannibal Corpse with Necrot. Uh, we're going to record it in June after we get back from the tour. Okay, so you guys are going to so be we, seasons we are, we are on the road. Be two, yeah, we're going to be playing two songs from the album on the tour. And uh, we 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 actually played one of the songs on the tour with you guys. Um, it's called Giza Power Plant. And uh, it's about eight minutes or something. And the whole middle section is like this Egyptian temple part that's all clean and psychedelic and uh, lots of flanger. And... Uh, we don't. I don't know what to call them, but we call them falling parts, where it sounds like the riff is sliding down the fretboard. You know, like I don't know, but there's lots of falling parts. <laughs> so. That sounds sick, man. And um, you know, we wish you guys a lot of luck on that tour. It's a big look for you guys. You guys have. Uh, if if people didn't think you worked hard for it, now then after everything we just discussed, there's no denying the hard work that went behind that. Um, I I, I can't wait to see you guys in New York on that tour, man. I just wanted to ask you quickly though. Let's not beat around the bush. There is a very small but vocal minority of um, kind of like trolling uh, detractors, is there not? Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I remember um, somebody uh, implying that uh, you guys' movement and your band somehow represent like an infiltration or a commercialization of the death metal scene. Like, what, what have, have you, do you guys respond to that in any way? You just let the haters hate and you play the decibel tour? I let them hate, and then I, I, I accept the offer to play these shows that they give me, and then I just hope that when those guys' bands were on tour in 2007 and their van broke down the first day of the tour, that they didn't give up, and then they continued on, and that you know they've been through a lot of different bands to explore a lot of different avenues of expression. They've been. I hope that they've released their own records. I hope that they've you know failed and rebuilt themselves i hope that they've moved across the country to join a band that then they quit and start a new band and they keep going and just you know i wish them luck because <laughs> it's so easy to just talk shit the easiest thing to do on the planet is to complain man to be like i don't like something but the con the reality is the the people who have an attachment to things being other than the way that they actually are like what i mean is objectively like i could say I don't like the temperature of this room. And it's like, well, the room is this temperature, man. You know, it's like, you can attempt to adjust the temperature, but you can't do that in Antarctica. You know, you got to build a little structure. You got to adapt. You got to overcome. That's right. And so people are like, I don't, I don't like the way this, this layout looks. I think that when I see a band's record, I'm like, man, this looks like shit. But rather than going on the internet and being like, I don't think your layout looks cool. I just make my layout look how I want it, which I think looks cool. You know what I mean? And well, people are like, I don't, I don't like this band's t-shirt design. It's like, that's chill. You know, some of my favorite bands, I don't wear their new shirts because I don't like their. I like this design. I like the old one. I like this one. You know, and I just encourage people to explore reality, to explore human consciousness and creativity, and to get off the internet and do something productive with their lives that isn't a reaction. Because word. when people hate, they're reacting to something that is already existing, and you're not going to be powerful if you're only reacting, because your response, that is a lag time in this quantum time matrix you experience called the holographic reality of life on this planet. And this time lapse between somebody creating something or something objectively experiencing manifestation outside of your realm, and then by the time you even get to respond, by the time you even have a response, you've even thought about whether you like it or not, it already exists, and you're two steps behind. So the only way you're going to actually manifest power for your creativity in life, whether it's for music, painting, being a good construction worker, making a pottery, like whatever you fucking want, man. You can't do it in response to other people because you're always going to be one step behind. But when you start to go inward and manifest your own personal consciousness towards something that you're focused on, because that's the little thing. Hate is focused. You give me power when you hate me. It's amazing. And awesome. people don't understand, they don't understand because they, you know, they're, they're operating out of... <clears throat> 
I don't. It's going to sound patronizing, but this is this is an actual like people in, in yoga and tai chi understand this. But like your subconscious focus is energy, and so your subconscious unconscious mind is more powerful than your conscious mind. And for the same reason why there's that latency and discrepancy between somebody doing something and you reacting to it, because you have to cognize it and re- respond intellectually. You know, you have to react. Whereas if you're emanating innately from your own core sense of being, your power is going to be more transcendentally fueled. And then it doesn't really matter what people do to complain about it, because it's like, dude, you can say my band is as whack as you want. Are you going to go to this Morbid Angel Cannibal Corpse show or not? <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah. It's like, yeah, you know, yeah. people people can be like, your band sucks. You're a hipster. It's like, dude, I don't think you were listening to Sir Gotham and Paysage Diva in 2006. I really don't. I think you probably had, you know, a fucking Modest Mouse shirt or you thought Radiohead was experimental because they don't play in 4-4 or whatever other meme you want to do about people nowadays. Yeah. But it's like, you know... It's so easy to hate. And I also want to encourage the haters because I used to hate, dude. Back in the day before, <laughs> the, like when yeah. there was only MySpace, yeah. I was a hater, man. Like before before Metal Sucks existed, when Decibel only cared about Mastodon and, and Converge, and like before Goat Metal existed besides four bands, before all this shit, I was literally on tour, dude, with long hair and a tape deck, you yeah. know, being like, I'm trying to play cold shit. And I want to be sick about it. And I was a hater and I was young. And I didn't realize that my hate, my subconscious hate, limited my creativity and reinforced the object of my hate's power over me. And that's something like people, Tony Robbins and like Trey Azagoth talk about this shit. It's like that power is real. And you can talk as much shit as you want. But like I said, dude, I, I got an email saying, you want to go to a morbid angel? And I was like, yes, easy. You know? <laughs> yeah, no doubt, bro. You you said a mouthful, man. And um, I you know I got to agree with what you said, man. Uh, you intellectualized it very well, and I think people are just wasting their energy with a lot of that stuff, man. And they're um, in the words of Puff Daddy, they're player hating from the sidelines because they don't know the work right. that goes on the inside of this. They don't know what it takes. They got to no tour idea for, what it means to be on yeah, tour. They weeks. got no idea. Like, dude, we had to get picked up by you guys in Florida because our fucking van was broken. You know what I mean? All sorts of shit that it's goes like, on, man. Yeah, they, they got no idea. They got no idea what it means to be stuck at the Ukrainian-Russian border <laughs> in the dark with no phone. I got no idea what that means. Nobody, dude, it's not good, Will. I'm telling you, it's not positive. <laughs> it's like a, it was horrible. a very intense thing. You know, they don't know what it means to be stuck on a fucking, like in, in my old band, Leech, when we were on tour with Val in 2008. And then, by the way, uh, my tape label, Woodsmoke, the third release Thou made was a split with my band Leech on this tape label and when we went on tour. And so it's like, if you weren't putting out tapes in 2008, can you really talk shit about my tape label? I don't know, dude. But also, Thou has like a hundred records and everyone's like, they're on NPR and they tour with fucking who the hell ever and all these things. And it's like, dude, Thou played at my house on their first tour ever in 2007. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Those dudes have been in it for so long. You know what I mean? They have been trying to do this since, you know, Matthew is a little older than me. I think he's at your age. But they've been doing it since before there was such a thing as the Nuclear War Now Forum. You know what I mean? Like, there's all this shit that people are just like, I'm elite because I'm on the internet. And it's just like, dude, that's <laughs> not what reality is, brother. You live in Black Mirror. You live yeah. in a hologram. You know, like, I know you live in a hologram out here, but the computer is like a matrix portal you're looking at. And you're seeing this weird mirror being like, look at my perfectly curated profile picture. Oh, I have God. the perfect MySpace background song. I have this elite font on my Instagram page that nobody can read because I am an artist. And it's like, okay, yeah. dude. I have more, more followers totally than fine. everyone and all that shit. Yeah, it's like, dude, that's not what reality is, dude. You know what I mean? And that's exactly why actual successful bands don't engage in that type of activity. But like you said, on the sidelines, there's all these vocalizations about whatever. Like, people criticize art, dude. People criticize painting and pottery. People criticize literally everything. Because the thing that takes the least amount of effort is to complain, you know, and to not like something that just is doing its thing. And I used to be that same way, dude. So, like, cause everyone tries to be like, I'm some weird hoity-toity fucking dude about it. But it's like, no, nah, man. I'm telling you this because I was there. I was this person. You and I not only are the same shards of consciousness in this weird meta being called the your world, I used to be you. That's why I know what you're doing is silly. You know, and that's like every old person is like, whatever. It doesn't have to say, it doesn't have to do with age. 
It's just about consciousness and experience. Mm -hmm. And like the reason why typically an old person tries to help a young person is because they have more experience. That's all. It's not age. You know, I'm only 32. I'm not old. But it's like when I was 15 years old, you know, <clears throat> and like trying to be like, oh, man, I want to screen print shirts and put out my own records and go on tour and play in the basements. That's like my whole fucking dream. I've been trying to do that since 2001, dude, 2002, when I first saw punk bands play. And I was like, well, you can do this. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. like my whole life. And so I just ask these people, I don't because I don't talk to them on the internet, but <laughs> I, I, you know, figuratively, I ask these people, what were you doing in 2002? And did you have a dream? And is what you're doing right now, complaining on the internet, have anything to do with your dream from 2002? Mm. Or are you fucking playing Dora's Adventure on a fucking Nintendo DS because <laughs> you're fucking 19 or 24 years old? You know what I mean? What the fuck were you doing in 2002, man? Yeah. I'm pretty sure it wasn't listening to Dystopia and Corrupted, you know, but I also don't know. And and the, 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 the flip of that, too, is if they, they're they they're older than you, then what are they doing hating on somebody young trying to come up and, and work hard, man? You know, I, well, that, you know, that's I'm, the other side. People love to hate on the younger people because the people, you know, they regret missed opportunities and they mm -hmm. want to say that things could have, should have, would have been another way. But like I said, man, attachment to the state of things other than the way that they actually are, that's like... Even Buddha said, don't do that, dude. 6,000 years ago, he's like, that's a waste of your energy, dude. Don't do that, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, can't, you can't change what is. You can only change you and your response to it, you know? And so if your response is always going to be a reaction rather than an action, you're always going to be late to the game, dude. You're not going to make it happen. Very wise words. Um, and, uh, Paul, we, we really appreciate your time, man. Uh, we know you're very busy, so we're going to start winding it down. Um, but with these last couple of statements you made, uh, you're obviously onto a lot philosophically, and there's a lot to be garnered from your lyrics. Um, I just wanted to actually quote something from uh, the Blood Incantation <coughs> song uh, on this, the split with uh, Spectral Voice, um, Mephitic Effluvia, if I said that right. Yeah, it's, and, it's a it's a it's a archaic term. It's like an old medical term for the the stench of miasma. Yeah, and oh, wow, and the um just learn something but the line the, the lines i wanted to read are born of blood and star spawn in caves beneath the earth siphoning the life source the life source of humans since their birth um and i think that that goes with a lot of uh what you could read into your lyrics w without um maybe we could even do a part two where we get into that uh to this interview but maybe you could suggest some reading material uh or something of that nature for people that are interested in your lyrics and these these type of philosophies and theories all right uh well it's it's kind of a double-edged sword because, you know, in general, I prefer <clears throat> transcendental esoteric philosophy, things like, um, you know, the Bhagavad Gita and the Srimad Bhagavatam are these ancient Hindu epics that talk about the nature of the holographic reality in cosmos. And then and the stuff like the Tibetan Book of the Dead is this huge influence for blood and capacious lyrics. And, um, you know, stuff like... <clears throat> Alan Watts, um, really simple things like this book called Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. These aren't like philosophical occult books. These are books that explain grandiose concepts in a very simple way. They're designed to be understood by the layperson or a child or someone who doesn't give a fuck about esotericism. They just, it's just when you read, your brain is subconsciously imprinted with these ideas. Whether you believe it or not, your brain is moving around as you interpret these words on this paper. And so it, another thing, I, why it's a double-edged sword, is like I read a lot of shit that I don't agree with. I just read it to see what this person has to say. And that's not something that's very common for people who read. And um, Because why would you read something that goes against your worldview? You know what I mean? People want to reinforce their worldview. And so I read a lot of stuff that I'm like, this dude is nuts. But there's this one aspect of his philosophy that is like, okay, you're onto it. You miss it because you're probably racist or you're stupid or whatever. But like, you you did touch on this little aspect of transcendental truth, and uh, you know I think that that is like the conspiracy element. Like I'll read almost anything, dude, and and a lot of it I'm just like this is hogwash and very funny. But then there's good concepts, you know. So like there's all the all the song titles on the next Blood Station record are all based out of books, and all this like we name our solo titles and stuff. And a lot of the solo titles are based on other books, and so like people are going to see that <clears throat> you know there's wide like there's books by Khalil Gibran, you know, the guy who wrote The Prophet, and then um, 
you know, a lot of like romantic, just, you know, these people, they, they're either religious or they're super pro government or whatever, but they believe in society, you know, which obviously I do not, but, uh, the, uh, some of them are like, we have a song called the Giza power plant. And it's like, you know, Egyptology says that the pyramids are 6,000 years old because the Bible and the Quran say that the earth is 6,000 years old. So they can't say that it's older, you know, even though it clearly has water damage that, existed from a, a pre-Deluge era when the Nile was miles closer to the, the Giza Plateau and why, um, you know, there's water damage at the base of the Sphinx that could have only been occurred pre-11,000 years ago because that was the last time there, there was that much water over there. Like, all this shit, you know, archaeology as a, as a concept is amazing, but ultimately the first archaeologists that were paid by the government or the state or the church, and they're, they're going out to find information which reinforces their worldview and reinforces their control over the common people of Earth. And it's like, that's not new, dude. People have been doing that since Sumer in modern-day Iraq, which used to be Babylon. People have been doing that in fucking Mesopotamia and Egypt in Nubia and Sudan, they've been doing it in South America. Like the whole concept of South America, even being Catholic, is like that's not right, dude. That's not what that's not what's going on over yeah. here. You guys yeah. are being lied to by your government. Mm-hmm. You're being lied to by your church. You're being lied to by your parents, and they're not lying to you because they hate you, dude. They're lying to you because they were lied to by the people before them. And that's just what mm-hmm. civilization is: this endless charade of misinformation. And so I warn people when you study esoteric philosophy or conspiracy theory, you have to keep your mind open. There isn't an answer. The ultimate truth is that there isn't one. You're not going to find it in a book. If you can find something anywhere that already exists, that's not the true truth. It's like in, in Taoism. And uh, the whole concept is like my religion has no words. It has nothing to teach anybody. Or like that which can be expressed is not the Tao. You know what I'm saying? The secret is the transcendental abstract. The, the material artifacts that people look at as like a book or a philosophy or, or whatever those are all fragments. It's like the platonic um, solids where it's like <clears throat> you got this perfect world somewhere and everything that exists here is a corrupted or rather a corruptible version of an innate, absolute, perfect perfect thing from someplace else. And so if you can find a book here that you think has all the answers, you just played yourself. You have all the answers inside of yourself. You have to use these symbols to help you remember that which you innately know to be true. And the whole concept of transcendental literature and, you know, the true occultism is not about goats. It has nothing to do with a penis. It has nothing to do with violence or racism or anything like that. The whole, the Zen and the Tao is all about consciousness. And if you're not pursuing consciousness, you just see some breadcrumbs that are left after this giant mystery. It's a few steps ahead of you, you know? Wow. Wow, you just said a mouthful, man. That's that's a lot to take in, and um, it's a lot of wisdom for uh, for me and for our listeners, man. I really appreciate that. Well, I just want to encourage people to explore the nature of reality. You know what I mean? Like I said, your personal power is infinite, and the government and haters online don't want you to know that. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I, I didn't mean to make uh, the, the hater uh, topic so big, but I'm glad we did. We went down that wormhole, and. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, hopefully, uh, listeners of the show, fans of, of Blood Incantation or any of your projects um, that listen, man, hopefully they got to learn a lot more about what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, and I feel like we really only cracked the surface today, man. We'd love if we could get you or some of your bandmates uh, back for a part two, um, maybe even after your tour and after your new album uh, that, that you're embarking yeah, on. Yeah, let's try that. Yeah, man. Thank you so much, Paul, for your time. We really appreciate you joining us. I know you have a very busy day. You have practices ahead of you. Please give our best regards to your bandmates and everyone else. And uh, the Heavy Hole Podcast uh, wishes you the best of luck on your new album with Blood Incantation and uh, this upcoming huge decibel tour supporting Morbid Angel and Cannibal Corpse with Necrot. Yeah, 